Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And folks, if you're getting up there like I am, today is a great episode for you to hear. We have got none other than the New York Times bestselling author, Guinness World Record holder, and a professional speed golfer, along as he's also a former national champion and number three world-ranked professional triathlete. He's written over a dozen books on diet, health, peak performance, and ancestral living, and is a popular speaker, retreat host, and face of the primal blueprint online multimedia education courses. Wow, that's a lot of stuff to get into. I wanna welcome Brad Kearns to the show. Brad, how you doing, man? Oh my gosh, Wade, I, I might have been at uh, level seven before your introduction, and now I'm up at like 9.5, ready to rumble. You could be a ring announcer in your spare time. Let's get ready for the podcast. Yeah, you, very you nice. Know it, you know it, you got it. Actually, I'm actually working on my own pitch. Uh, I have my own saying because I love Michael Buffer and Bruce Buffer and that whole thing. I am going to work that in it sometimes. If you're listening, Dana White, you need to get me on a trial. But anyways, Brad, you know, there's so many things to talk about here. Um, I know you, we're going to get into a lot of things. We're going to talk about micro workouts today. We're going to talk about cold plunges. We're going to talk about MOFO, something that you're doing as well. But tell me a little bit for our listeners that might not be familiar with you, Brad. How did you, like, who is Brad Kearns? How did you get in this whole journey and become such a, a big face of, of kind of what's possible in biological optimization? Oh my gosh, that's so funny you asked that question today because I just finished recording this podcast episode for my podcast, Get Over Yourself, it's called. Uh, I had a great interview with you. I can't wait till that drops and uh, people will love going over there and listening to you being on the hot seat instead of the interview seat. Uh, but the episode was uh, titled Meet Brad after 200 episodes. And I just told my own story, uh, kind of going through my childhood when I was obsessed with sports and being active and having fun before the age of uh, digital entertainment and, and uh, mobile devices. And, you know, going through my, my journey as an athlete and how important that was to my life. And then, you know, my adult life being in the, the health and fitness scene. And I was inspired to do it. Uh, by some other guys that have done a cool job, uh, you know, introducing their audience to what they're really all about. One is Luke Story, the Lifestyles podcast. I'm sure you uh, know yeah, him. He's your guy. former neighbor in Venice. And um, also Abel James does a really cool thing on his website where he just, you know, talks in detail about his musical background, his childhood. So it was really fun to record this thing and then go back and listen to it and find out, who this Brad Kearns guy is, but uh, I'm really trying to uh, honor the title of my podcast, Get Over Yourself. And that was the most profound lesson I learned through the athletic experience that when we get so competitive and focused and driven and disciplined and want to excel so badly and to rise above the rankings and especially in sports where the rankings are very black and white, um, a lot of times that can serve to uh, bring suffering and disappointment. And so what I learned through my athletic experience and I apply to all areas of my life is that when you are motivated for the right reasons, for the pure love of the journey, and you, can, you are able to release the attachment of your self-esteem to the outcome of what you're doing, I feel like that's when we have a chance to be at our center of power for peak performance and not only uh, perform to the highest level, but also enjoy the whole experience rather than just being a successful pull with a Ferrari who cuts people off in traffic and is mean to his girlfriend and uh, so on down the list. So uh, I'm kind of this work in progress where I'm really trying to have fun. You'll hear me being silly on this show and on my own show and not taking myself too seriously. But at the same time, 
you know, life is short. Um, you might as well go for it. I feel like we're now immersed in this world of uh, luxury and decadence and nonstop, uh, you know, entertainment options where we can just sit back and consume uh, YouTube videos and social media and not do anything significant with our life where we push and challenge ourselves. So I'm also about that way, especially we talked, you know, on our other show and offline, you know, now I'm 55 year old guy. So the guy you read about in the bio who was on the triathlon on circuit and was winning the, the the races on the you know on the uh, on the global circuit that was a long time ago man and i can certainly tell stories if you want to ask me questions about back in the day but what's most important is what i'm doing with my life right now and if i can find a way to maintain that that wonderful passion and competitive intensity that i had as a as an elite athlete and so that's kind of what i'm all about and uh, what my favorite uh, subject to talk about is that's a you bring up a really good point because I think both of you, you and myself uh, enjoy a competitive past and and you know when you're competing for you and a lot of endurance athletes I mean you've got some great track records as well it's pretty impressive but it, it it's a it's a very single-minded focus to become even a nationally ranked athlete, let alone a world-class athlete. I mean, it, like the jump from say local to state is a big jump and from state to national is a big jump and from national to world is a ginormous leap. It's real, like everybody's really extraordinary and it takes almost a, well, it does. It takes a single-minded obsessive focus for excellence. At, but, and I think there might be a, a, a cue here because there's a part here you've kind of transcended into, you, you've rounded out the corners of your life, if you will. And I think it's in the get over yourself component. So how did that kind of fuse into who you are today? Like, you know, that foundation of that ultra uber competitive athlete into a more well-rounded, holistic oriented person. What, what was the aha moment or, or do you think that's a natural transition or was it something that you struggled with? Yo, know, good question. Um, one part is just getting older, right? And there's not a lot of great things about getting older. I'm, I'm so much more easily injured and take so much longer to recover from my great workouts. And so, you know, some of that's a bummer, but I think that wisdom and that life experience allows you to look back with a much healthier perspective than when we were living and breathing this stuff at the age of 27 and, you know, you had a bad workout and, and the rest of your day you're in a bad mood and, and weird stuff like that. But I do have to credit um, getting my ass kicked over and over and picking myself up off the ground and doing some important self-reflection, looking in the mirror, going, gee, what's going on? Uh, I'm training as hard as I can. I'm totally devoted and disciplined in all the description that you just made, and it's not working out for me. What's the missing piece? And that's when I had to have this awakening that when I could just relax. And for example, one of my favorite one-liners, take what your body gives you each day and nothing more. Don't force things to happen that aren't naturally meant to be, especially in the realm of fitness, but we can be talking about many other uh, uh, challenges and peak performance realms. Uh, you know, I'm a father. My kids are now 22 and 20. Um, you know, I, I was a racer before I became a father. So as a parent, I'm referencing constantly this idea of getting over myself, uh, not attaching my self-esteem to the accomplishments of my kids or even my effectiveness as a parent, realizing that a lot of it's out of my hands and the important hitting those big picture items like uh, giving unconditional love and support and also knowing how to establish boundaries and guidelines and parameters. And boy, that's um, it, it's kind of fun to see everything in, in a light where you can just relax a little bit and try to remember uh, what's important in life rather than get sucked into this rat race mindset, which is so easily, we're so easily drawn into that, uh, especially in today's era of, you know, the airbrushed world of, of social media. And, you know, both of us are, uh, uh, you know, thought leaders and we're trying to create a following and it's very easy to kind of uh, tiptoe off the edge and become inauthentic or who, who knows what, you know, there, 
there, there's a lot of people that I, I look that are shaping culture, but they're not really, uh, they don't really seem to be happy, well-balanced, and even uh, truthful to, you know, who they really are. They're just kind of a puppet. And so that's the part that we really need to dig deeper. That's why the long form of podcast is so important is, you know, if I, if the show's over right now and, you know, Brad Kearns is going to send you off with a couple tips to uh, swallow your vitamins in the morning and eat my super shake in the afternoon, and then we're gone. Uh, it's not as meaningful as when we, we get down into it and, and touch and connect with people in a, in a meaningful manner. Yeah. You brought up something that I think that's really important. I think in today's world, we have these two, divergent aspects of social media and that's the 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 clickbait kind of stuff the tantalizing ads the little you know the sexual overtones or whatever on the instagram models and stuff like that yeah can you give an example (laughs) yeah and then we have this other side which is this deepening long format podcast kind of interview style which is spearheaded by the tim ferris's and the joe rogan's and these type and then you have the intellectual dark web which is its own thing as well and we're seeing this rapid growth so there seems to be a hunger both for both sides it's kind of like people are going into two sets but you bring up i want to tie this all together in that i believe that a lot of the population has become an observer and and we've we've got so many observational components we've become voyeurs to life as opposed to actual participants in life but it seems like you've cracked the code on really maintaining and being a participant do you feel that's easier for people such as ourselves that grew up in the age without internet and weren't conditioned from an early age as opposed to maybe your kids who've really been born and bred in the digital age. What do you, what do you see as a father and as, as also as an influencer yourself? Oh my gosh. I mean, that's a tough one. And I think we should all ask ourselves that question. Um, it seems to me the secret is to uh, have some discipline and self-control with the way that we consume technology because there's no turning back. There's no hearkening for the old days. Uh, I remember when you know my, my entertainment time was to read books rather than uh, watch videos and, and do short snippets of uh, you know, soundbite content, which seems to be uh, really prevalent now, but you know we're still in control. Uh, you, you can still uh, turn off your camera and microphone today and walk out to the beach with no device and just stare at the waves and probably have a growth experience of some kind. You might even think up a new product when you're out there and great you know breakthroughs happen of that kind. So I just moved to Lake Tahoe last year and one of the driving reasons was just to be closer to nature so I could go out and swim in the lake every single day year round. We're going to talk about cold plunge in a moment, but uh, things like that, that can easily be uh, discarded off to the side if we're not really paying close attention. So I'm really trying to create a lifestyle where, uh, sure, I'm immersed in it just like everybody else. I love watching the instructional videos on YouTube to learn how to high jump better and uh, connect so wonderfully to advance knowledge so quickly. Uh, But boy, if we can learn how to use that off switch at whatever age, so I didn't really answer your question. I mean, the kids have a rough time today too, but oh my gosh, the off button works for everybody. So I don't think there's, um, we, you know, we're all uh, succumbing to it. We're not immune to it. And I think we're all obligated, but especially, man, my heart goes out to uh, the young people that, you know, didn't even have a reference point of the childhood of playing in the forest and Wade's story of going way out into the rural area and had nothing else to do except, you know, hoist some heavy weights and, and get on the journey that you were on. Um, today, man, you could be like the guy watching the bodybuilding contest on YouTube. It would be, you know, yeah. you'd, you'd just be entertaining yourself in the same way and i think i should put in a plug like yeah we've turned into a um, a spectator lifestyle now and there's nothing inherently wrong with that uh unless you feel a sense of a pain and a void 
And I'm going to argue that most of us probably will if we're just sitting back and not challenging ourselves physically or even uh, intellectually um, and just, just watching and consuming more and more Netflix. I think there is a deep down sense of, uh, you know, something missing. Uh, but, you know, we don't want to judge that. So I don't want to put like pressure on people to say, hey, uh, you know, this person talking on a podcast or, or giving you this video uh, is a superior physical specimen to you. And so you should feel bad about yourself. And it's easy to fall into that mindset, too, where you just get discouraged because you're not as badass and, uh, you know, you can't afford the Ferrari nor have the giant muscles uh, of the person that you're, you know, consuming content from. So we all got to do the best we can every single day and little things make a big difference. And oh my gosh, it's, you know, uh, just, just hanging around with my dog and watching her jump in the Creek and run around looking for fish this morning was, you know, a highlight of my day. It was free and it didn't even have anything to do with me, but uh, you know, there's little things every day that we can take a deep breath and enjoy. Well, a couple things I want to get into on specifics um, with your, lifestyle as it is and you can touch on whichever order that you want and i think that's something that you referred to earlier before we got on here and that's micro workouts and cold plunges as ways of really fighting off the decline that is normally associated with aging and one of the great advantages i think of being a, a, a i always feel this way is because I was a world-class athlete at one point in my career, and, and you hit that peak and then you start to experience the decline, you actually start to see the ravages of the aging process happen much earlier noticeably as a top-level athlete because the margins of error are so slim. And, you know, that 1% difference is the difference between first and like 17th, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's like a huge amount. And you're like, well, I can't hit it or I can't recover or I'm injured or all that stuff. And you start, the natural progression is, well, how do I maintain my performance or at least how do I stay healthy? So I think we get an advantage where maybe the general population, it's, it's a medical issue, it's a heart disease, it's diabetes, it's some sort of medical uh, intervention that needs is required to kind of wake them up to a whole oh, wait a second you know my life or my health isn't a guarantee um when you made that transition how did like where did this whole concept of micro workouts and cold plunges and stuff fit into your kind of health healthy aging optimization program Oh my gosh, I feel so excited about this concept of micro workouts. I think it's going to be one of the great breakthroughs in the fitness world in many decades. The breakthrough of the century, if you will, since we're early into the century. Uh, and the concept is simple that uh, you can perform these brief bouts of explosive effort and have a tremendous uh, overall fitness benefit and lifestyle benefit without worrying about the complexity and the extreme energy requirement of a proper uh, workout session. And, you know, I've been in the fitness industry for a long time, just like you. And I, and there's a lot of things we can shake our head at. And one of them is this penchant for these overly stressful workouts, especially with the novice enthusiast who shows up at the gym on January 1st, signs up for the 12 pack of workouts with the trainer. And on April fool's day, they've spun out of there because the workouts were too strenuous and they didn't adhere to it because it, it represented pain and suffering to them. So I think a lot of the uh, fitness modalities are overly stressful. I used to work for the spinning program, the indoor cycling program, and a lot of my efforts were toward educating the instructors that you didn't have to crush your clientele every single workout, screaming at them to finish the climb to the top of the hill on the, uh, the, the theoretical Tour de France route. And we still see that today where uh, CrossFit is so popular and it's so cool. And I have so many great things to say about uh, the varied workout environment and the challenge and the camaraderie, the social aspects. But I have to say, every time I've done a CrossFit workout, 
I had this inclination to sneak out of the back door of the gym at the two thirds mark because I had given such a tremendous energy output to do the rope climb and then run around the block at a high speed and then do some box jumps. And it was so much fun and, and it was, you know, so difficult. But at a certain point, it's like, all right, I'm good. I've, I've put out a lot. I know I'm going to have some recovery time ahead of me and it's time to pull the plug. But we have a tendency to want to go to the extreme, to adhere to this no pain, no gain ethos that's been programmed into our brain since we were, we were little kids, you know, on the, on the football field and the coach screaming and blowing the whistle or the track route in, in my case. And so that part, I think we need to unwind and realize that fitness is much more simple and less pain and suffering than we think. And so when you take the example of a micro workout, it could be uh, you listening in your work cubicle right now, because we want to listen to wage shows during the work day. That's really important. Uh, okay. But you could be in your work cubicle and lower down for a set of 20 deep squats. And you have a little micro session of muscle stimulation and a heart rate elevation and all that. And then you resume your, uh, your busy day after what, a minute or a minute and a half of effort. And if you can sprinkle these in to your largely sedentary day, we're talking to most listeners, right? If you have a busy job at the warehouse and you're lifting boxes all day, you probably don't need to uh, worry about micro workouts as much as a knowledge worker, right? Uh, but if you can throw these things in to break up these prolonged periods of stillness, which are now being seen as such a devastating impact on health, uh, you, you meet all these different objectives. One of them is to break up the stillness and improve the metabolic function of the body during the day. The other one is if you add these up, they add up to a tremendous cumulative fitness benefit over time. Uh, one of my favorite examples is I have the hexagonal deadlift bar and it's in my backyard and it's on the path to the garbage can uh, from the kitchen. So when it's time to throw away uh, some garbage, I walk around the side of the yard and I pass by this hex bar. And every time I pass by, I, I do a set. Maybe I'll do two sets one time. And it's not a proper workout. I might be <laughs> not dressed or whatever, uh, but I'll go and lift this bar. Uh, I'm a pretty strong guy, so I have 200 pounds on the bar weight. And so if I do, let's say, uh, six uh, reps, of 200 pounds. I know that's nothing for you uh, strength people listening, but I'm still lifting 1,200 pounds when I throw away the 20 pound uh, bag of garbage. And so if that's my routine and that's part of my lifestyle and we talk 365 days later and I do this however many sets in a week's time, like five or six or seven sets in a week, not counting my workouts, right? I might go out there and do a workout and then I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I do five sets of this or whatever. But uh, outside of that, I'm lifting, let's say hundreds of thousands of extra pounds in a year, which dramatically elevates the platform from which I launch all my formal workout sessions. So I reduce injury risk and I have a higher fitness level. It's not like it tires me out or it's gonna compromise my real workout the next day. It's just having a more active daily lifestyle rather than sitting and then sitting some more when it's time to relax and watch Netflix after your long day sitting at the computer. Yeah, that's so, uh, it seems like that kind of would mimic how maybe humans are naturally inclined to do. I mean, if you live out in a rural environment like I did, for example, or you're mowing the grass on the, on the lawnmower and then you got to get off and you've got to move some books, rocks out of the way or some sticks that have fallen down. And then you've got to, you know, an hour later, you got to lug something here from the truck to the barn. And then, you know, a couple hours later, you, you know, it's, somebody gets stuck uh, with the truck and you're, li you're lifting, moving stuff like it. There are these kind of like m literally micro workouts, like how many micro workouts could a person do in a day? Oh my gosh. I have a, a, a buddy of mine and frequent podcast guest named Dude Spellings. And he is an amateur enthusiast down in Austin, Texas. He has a, a full-time career, but he's also a health coach and he's deep into the, the scene and a wealth of knowledge. And he's really pursued some of these, uh, uh, these, these, 
techniques and strategies uh, to a deep extent. And so his challenge for um, COVID was that he set a little alarm on his computer uh, on the hour and he would do, I believe it was 30 push-ups on the hour, eight hour workday. So all of a sudden he's doing 240 push-ups a day, and then he added on a, a, a quick walk around the, uh, the the complex where he lives, and so it was uh, I think a half a mile or something. So now all of a sudden he's walking four miles a day, doing uh, you know 250 push-ups, and all of a sudden his fitness is skyrocketing. He's he's getting ripped. He's dropping body fat, and it's it's nothing. It's not even his workout patterns have changed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've heard all these excuses this year, like, well, you know, my gym's closed. So I, I added, I gained a bunch of weight and I got out of shape. Uh, the whole thing's thrown me off. And, you know, here's an opposite case of someone who, you know, just set a computer alarm and then who, who can't do 30 push-ups? You know, if you're a fit person, it's nothing. It takes, it takes probably one minute. Uh, but you know the 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 break and the ability to regenerate so that these things aren't strenuous, that to me also is valuable because I was noticing, uh, you know, as I was getting older, my workouts would take a long time to recover from, and it was kind of frustrating because I'd go and do my sprinting and things that really meant a lot to me, and I was trying to get better, uh, but then you know I'd have stiff calves for three or four or five days afterward. And this would inhibit my progress because I was in recovery and rebuild mode so frequently. I, maybe I wasn't taking enough uh, Bioptimizer product, but you know, the mm -hmm. soreness and this fatigue after hard workouts was uh, something that I had to reflect on. And now there's some great leaders in the fitness scene like Dr. Phil Maffetone, Dr. Craig Marker, uh, your Canadian cohort, uh, Firas Sahabi, who's a, a MMA trainer, Joel Jameson, also in the MMA world at eightweeksout.com. And they're advocating kind of a recovery-based approach to athletic training, even for the world's elite athletes, where you tone down that crazy uh, go to the well type of workout strategy where you're puking on the side of the track or you know in between the, the machines and instead just maintain kind of a uh, a respectable baseline where you're going out and you're putting out energy every day, but it's not taxing you and straining you and making you sore. And so there's this, this distinct uh, admonition, especially from Dr. Maffetone, who I've known for a long time. He says, you know, you, you shouldn't get sore uh, after workouts. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm sore all the time. I'm sore after every time I sprint. But it really makes a lot of sense because if your muscles are sore, then they're in the rebuilding and, and restoration mode rather than the growth or fitness improvement mode. So what I've tried to do is like tone down that competitive craziness that I still carry with me from decades ago and go out to the track and do a sprint workout where I'm well within myself, much more so uh, than I might have been previously. Uh, there's a great article, one of the best articles I've read in, in years and years uh, by Dr. Craig Marker on BreakingMuscle.com called HIT versus HURT. And HIT, of course, we know is high intensity interval training, those tough workouts where you try to stick to yet another interval and another and another and really challenge yourself on numbers eight, nine, and 10 and try not to slow down and you're not resting enough in between. And so you end that workout, you're depleted, you're exhausted, you want to go straight to Jamba Juice and have the, the medium scone and the, and the smoothie and get a massive slam of sugar. Um, and the the alternative concept is called HURT, high intensity repeat training. So the repeat means that every time you perform an explosive effort, you want it to be of consistent quality as you proceed through the workout. So my template sprint workout is uh, eight times 70 meter uh, full sprint uh, across the football field or what have you. And so on the first one, I feel pretty good. I'm rested, I'm well warmed up and ready. And on the fourth one, and on the fifth one, and on the sixth one, I still feel fantastic and I'm delivering an effort of equal quality and time to the first one. 
And one of the reasons is because I do what Dr. Marker recommends is take luxurious rest intervals in between these efforts, rather than towing the line because I'm a tough guy and I used to be an endurance athlete and I can recover quickly and handle a lot of pain and go and do another sprint while I'm still trying to catch my breath and my legs are still you know, traumatized from the previous sprint. So the workout, you walk away from the track feeling less taxed, less trashed, you also ran faster and delivered a higher quality performance. And I'm talking sprinting. You could be talking about this with kettlebells or whatever you're doing in the gym where you're just you know, focused on explosive output with excellent form and not trashing your body in the process. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, supercharge your protein shake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of masszymes into your shake. One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S H A K E. One zero at masszymes.com. That's shake10 at masszymes.com. You know, it's interesting how things cycle around. Of course, years ago, the Bulgarians uh, began training their Olympic athletes uh, five, six times a day and taking these massive rests between lifting protocols. And then I remember. Um, Ben Johnson, uh, the famous sprinter, of course, he tested positive during the Olympics. I mean, all the, I mean, according to Linford Christie, everybody in that final was on, you know, was, was on chemicals, but that's besides the point that some, we can still learn from some of the training methodologies. He would take up to 15 minute rests yeah. between explosive exercises because they were always working on that quality and the explosiveness and you couldn't deny uh, drugs aside, uh, how effective of a sprinter he was and how uh, performance. And I find that interesting. This is kind of coming back into vogue again, maybe right. from a little bit more holistic uh, perspective about these m micro training components and, and not going. So if you were to say, let's say these hurt training, if you will, um, Walk us through what that sprint program looks like for you today uh, on a typical day. And, and then maybe how many times would you do that in a week? Boy, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Ben Johnson, the, the great Canadian sprinter and his coach, Charlie Francis, arguably the best sprint coach ever. And mm -hmm. it was so sad to see, you know, the, the way the mainstream media and the people not plugged into the world of athletics just threw everything out in the garbage because uh, Ben possibly got a, a, a spike test too. There's a lot of conspiracy theories because Correct. he wasn't taking that drug near Correct. the Olympics. He was taking a it, but he wasn't taking stanozol all and all yeah. of a sudden he's testing positive and they're like what that doesn't make sense yeah. <laughs> my other favorite doping positive test was this runner uh marty vino from finland who got the silver medal in the 10,000 in 1984 in la and he tested positive for this really obvious anabolic steroid that clears the system within days and no athlete would be stupid enough to test positive for that and they, they couldn't figure it out couldn't figure it out and then finally they realized that he, he had blood doped. So they had pulled his blood six weeks prior during a training cycle and then stuck it back into him, you know, two nights before the race, uh, which, you know, you can't test for blood doping. That was the great Finnish strategy that was, you know, known to be a Scandinavian origin. And so he had blood doped with his own dirty blood uh, full of steroids and, got, and lost his silver medal in the Olympics. But that's an aside that uh, we, can, we can shake our heads at. But yeah, Charlie Francis, I read his wonderful book about sprinting it helped me a lot and that eye-opening thing that they would take 15 minute rest periods uh, we now know that you can probably correct me but uh, the re the full replenishment of ATP 
in the cell takes something like five minutes or three to five minutes or something yeah like it that. can take that long depending on how much you deplete it and what's the conditions there's a variety of var variables on it it's a fascinating component so going back to your kind of sprint routine how, how does that work like how oh, it's, yes, how does that work us, putting us back on track after the 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 memory lane yeah we, yeah, we went down that memory lane the, the, which was, was, was so kind of the first eye, well that was the kind of the first eye opener because ben johnson wasn't the face uh, of, of track athletes. And, you know, of course we had the great Carl Lewis, who was the, the U S favorite and, and, and kind of the, the poster boy who was defeated in that race. And then of course, after the testing and got his gold medal. And of course, later on was proven that he was doping as well as everybody else. And n n not to discredit any of these people or take away from their athletics. I think that was the first eye opener that, oh, well, these athletes are on drugs. Uh, it's far more uh, prolific than the general public is led to believe. And of course, the general public, if they opened up their cabinet, is on an, a, a vast mm. array of performance enhancing drugs so they can go to work, whether that's painkillers or antidepressants or blood sugar medication or heart medication, or uh, anxiety yeah. pills or sleep pills and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of like, I don't yeah. understand, yeah. like, can't we just get to the truth? Can't we get to accuracy and can't we just make people healthier, which is what we're all about? Yeah, the lawyers who were uh, bringing down Ben Johnson were taking Adderall to finish their case in time for the, <laughs> yeah, the morning yeah. court session. It's brutal, man. And I mean, we, we can get ourselves going here, but uh, I, I kind of like to make that distinction of uh, an athlete who's cheating versus a sport which has uh, become dirty largely thanks to the governing bodies um, i go way back with lance armstrong i wrote a book about yeah. him called how lance does it which is now a funny title uh, since everything blew up but we have to remember that you know there's 200 people on the tour de france and they were all confirmed to be using all manner of doping products lance r handled it really stupidly and it, and it affected his public image and he harmed a lot of people with his aggressive stance but we still have to remember that that you know he's the greatest cyclist of all time Absolutely. and the other interesting thing that I'll, I'll leave you with before i answer your original question is like you know if the sport were squeaky clean and the best athletes were allowed to come out the best athletes who worked the hardest had the best strategy the most discipline uh, arguably lance would have won the tour de france by 20 minutes instead of two minutes because he was clearly you know the athlete of, of the century when he was 15 years old he was racing with guys like me on the pro circuit i could hardly believe my eyes that this young human had ascended to a world-class level that takes years and years of training all day long and here's this kid who's a, a high school punk that's hanging with the top pros in the world in triathlon so he was truly a gifted athlete had a great career uh, but all that mess that big time sports is it's kind of it's kind of tough to navigate through at times but then navigating through my sprint workout is easy because i have the wonderful strategy where uh you know instead of trying to recover so quickly and push myself to do another sprint I take my time and I relax and I try to formulate the mentality of a sprinter rather than that mentality of endurance athlete, which I had for so many decades before. So it's kind of fun because you can, you know, kind of channel Usain Bolt or Ben Johnson and realize that these athletes are so finely tuned and so explosive and so fit because they're able to you know, deliver maximum output and, and, you know, even for a short time. And I feel like for most of us, most of us listening who are into fitness, you're probably deficient on that maximum, uh, maximum output end of the spectrum. And in contrast, you go into the gym and you see the people climbing the stair machine and watching CNN on the television. And of course, they're getting their cardio and it's certainly better than sitting at home. But if you'd never challenge yourself and push yourself to the maximum output, you're going to be missing all these anti-aging benefits, uh, the bone density, the muscle mass, uh, you know, the preservation of muscle mass, which is a huge anti-aging uh, factor. And also, when you're able to sprint or give maximum effort on your kettlebell swings or whatever you're doing, uh, your perceived exertion and your performance at all lower intensities uh, is much better. So when I can... Uh, you know, learn how to sprint competently. 
my form as a, as a runner in this example uh, is superior even when I'm jogging because I've learned with the, you know, the highest penalty possible when you have a, a poor technique when you're sprinting, uh, you know, the, the loss of uh, forward momentum is huge rather than when you're jogging, you can shuffle along. And I have a video on YouTube, viral video, baby. One of my goals in life, I got 700,000 views. It's called Brad Kern's Running Technique Instruction. And it was wow. just me and, me and my guy, Brian, my filmmaker, having fun in a park one day. And I, you know, I, I delivered a lot of these insights where, you know, what you learn when you're, when you're running at maximum speed and trying to get maximum propulsive force off each stride directly translate to how to be a better jogger and how to minimize the impact trauma that causes so many injuries among the massive packs of marathon runners. So whoever you are and whatever your performance goal is, even if it's an ultra endurance type of thing, getting competent at maximum output, maximum explosive efforts is a wonderful addition to your fitness program. And if it's not going to be running because your joints and muscles, you're not used to it, you can sprint uphill, upstairs, or you can do things on the exercise bike. I have this bike called the Carol bike, C-A-R-O-L, and it's an eight-minute workout template. And a lot of research and science behind it, you probably can know which studies they're referencing, that if you can sprint a couple times at maximum effort, and the whole workout's over in eight minutes, your fitness can progress dramatically over time, your fat reduction goals, all these things can actually come out superior to going and pushing yourself several times a week with a, a you know 45 minute spin class that's a little too strenuous, that stimulates glucose burning, glucose appetite, a carbohydrate appetite, and you know kind of puts you at high risk of, of breakdown, burnout, illness, and injury. Funny you should say that because I'm doing these, um... A uh, couple times, t- times a week, I hit the attack bike on my uh, up on my deck right now, which is eight minutes. I do these twenty second sprints and 47, 40 second recoveries, and and then you know I push to that point where I I can't seem to recover my breath very well, and then that's it. It's literally between six and eight minutes, and then I vary that. I'll drop down to you know ten second, ten second intervals and i've been thinking because i've read some of this research i haven't yet tried it i'm going to do an experiment really soon about doing these like one all-out sprint seven eight times in a day like you get in and like once an hour you come back and do it and just see what happens physiologically from have you tried anything like that because we haven't still got to that sprint session but i'd like to kind of get into some little bit of meat here on on yeah some of the sprint you know things that you're um doing. i've tried that stuff and, and, and I, I have this like living room here in my new home. Well, it's not new, it's, it's beat to heck. I mean, it, has, it needs a remodel uh, project we're, we're hoping someday soon, but uh, I have the opportunity to kind of trick out my living room with all these strange little fitness contraptions. One of them's the X3 bar. Uh, I got one I of those, these, those are great. they're yeah, great. Yeah. And strength I've curve said, is totally different on incredible. That. Yeah. Yeah. So, I really like it. you know, it's, it's a, a great discovery that you can, uh, you know, tire yourself out pretty well with very short duration workouts. And even the Carol bike, when I first got it, I was having so much fun and I was doing it a couple times a week, a few times a week. And then pretty soon you're like, you know what, even, you know, the, the eight minute workout, if you only do it a couple times a week, that's plenty because it's so, it's so strenuous. And uh, same with my sprints. If I'm out there once a week, uh, I'm pretty happy with that pattern over time. And I think as we progress with you know, our fitness competency, we have to be more and more intuitive with our workout planning rather than regimented. And so mm-hmm. I think that's another breakthrough that's necessary uh, for the fitness professionals listening, the trainers that are trying to set your client up on a, on a pattern schedule, and especially the triathlon coaching scene, which I was a part of for so long. It just doesn't work to charge people money for their six-week program that says on, on Thursday, the 27th, two weeks from now, you're going to do a really long swim, and then you're going to ride your bike 100 miles after that. It just, it doesn't fold into real life very well. 
maybe for an Olympic athlete at the training center <laughs> or, you know, Hikam El Garou's the greatest miler of all time up in the mountains of Morocco where they know what he's going to do for the next 17 weeks straight because all he's doing is living a monk-like existence and, and training to break mm -hmm. the world record. But for most of us, we have to go with the flow. We have to feel where our body's at on a given day. Sometimes we feel lazy because we've had a long, stressful day at work. You got to get up there onto the roof and start pedaling. And you'll know you, Wade, and also the listener, after a couple few minutes, you know where you're at. You know yep. whether you're ready to, to bang one out or whether you just need to cruise and look at the seagulls. And I think we got to bring that voice back into play more so than just this hard headed approach where we got to get it done. Otherwise, we're a, a slacker. You, you bring up a really good thing and it's something I've learned to do because I was so rigid in regimen as a, a, when I was on my training programs. And like, you know, I can remember a part in my career where I had to improve every single workout no matter what, right? That that was the rule. And I would not leave the gym. It didn't matter if I was screaming. It didn't matter if I bar barfed my guts out. It didn't matter whatever. I was going to improve. And I wrote down, okay, I got eight reps with this rate next time. That's, I'm going, I'm getting nine no matter what. And it was a real <laughs> mental drill. But now you bring up a good point. It's like, so uh, I think I'd, I'd just moved. I'd traveled. I got back from Zen a week ago. I said, oh, well, you know, I haven't got to do the bike. And I went, up on the, I went up on the thing and I have my eight rounds scheduled. Well, I hit, I hit round three and I'm like, I'm done. You know, like I'm wasting my time here because I could totally feel that I didn't have that output that day. It was, it was just not there. And I said, you know what, my body's not ready for this. Now, conversely, Four days later, I got some biohacking stuff going on here. I got some recovery modalities. I got in my plate, got everything. Whatever. I went back and said, hey, you know what? I think I'm, I'm ready to hit the bike in the morning. And I banged out an extra one because eight felt better than the, the third one I did the other day. I said, you know, I'm going to do just one more round because I'm feeling really good. And so that's one thing I've noticed as I've gotten older is that allowing myself that variance allowing myself it's there today or it's not there today not having to force it just kind of allowing it to kind of its own rhythm and stuff i want to talk about modalities uh cold plunges and its role in your life and why you think that's so important and and, and well first off can you explain to people what a cold plunge is how it is and how tough it is and, uh, and, then, and then how you kind of worked your way through that whole model. Yeah, geez, I don't know how I got started. I guess it was my friend, Dave Cobran, my childhood friend. And uh, I went over to his uh, master bedroom and he had an ice machine plugged in <laughs> near his master bath. And he was explaining how he made these ice blocks and dropped them into his tub and was doing the cold plunge. And I think we can all reference uh, our whole our whole lives back when we were young or, you know, when we're out on vacation uh, at, at the lake uh, or, you know, on a ski trip and we jumped in the snow and did snow angels and then back into the jacuzzi and when we expose ourselves to cold water uh, we get this incredible uh, invigorating sensation right away even a, a 10 second plunge into the the chilly river before you race back into the warm cabin and obviously the research is now you know this is becoming a a modality a, a biohacking favorite and there's some wonderful research that shows that you get an instant hormonal boost when you uh, expose yourself to cold Cold water or those cold air chambers that are, uh, you know, they have the expensive centers around, but cold water is uh, 21 times more conductive than air. So uh, the, the water is a really great way to experience this. And so in a very short time, you get this incredible boost of the mood elevating hormone norepinephrine and related uh, adaptive hormones so that you feel alert, energized, uh, refreshed, uh, you know, love and life, that kind of thing. And the effects last for quite some time. There's some research from Finland uh, that a 20 second exposure to water temperature of 40 degree Fahrenheit results in a 200 to 300% boost in norepinephrine that lasts for up to an hour. 
So as far as a morning wake-up call, and the, the uh, beginning entry point here is simply a cold shower, especially if you live in Canada or somewhere where the water's coming out cold. If we're in Phoenix and we're in the summertime, that cold shower is not going to be too impressive. You might have to no. go to greater lengths. But you can uh, get a sense of what this is all about by getting in your shower and then you know cranking that handle over to full cold for the last minute or two of the shower. And the way to kind of overcome this initial shock response where you scream and you can't stand it and it's too cold for you is to uh, engage in a, uh, some intentional deep diaphragmatic breaths. So this is, you're probably familiar with Wim Hof listeners. He's done these amazing feats of cold exposure and it's all through breath control that he's able to override this uh, initial fight or flight shock response that uh, compels us to jump right out of the river and get back into the, the warm cabin or the warm shower. So I'm a normal everyday guy. I was actually the guy who got cold first when I was doing the swim training when I was a triathlete I'd start shivering when everyone else was fine. So I don't have any, you know, magical powers, but I really got into this and made it a centerpiece of my life. So I, I upgraded from the cold shower. The next logical step is uh, the ultimate step is the chest freezer. So I have this uh, 15 cubic foot chest freezer top opening where you put meat in there or whatever. I filled it up with water. I have it on a timer. So it's cooled at all times to 34 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll go in there now my morning session takes five to six minutes and it's completely comfortable. I'm not shivering or freezing. So I don't want the listener to get the wrong idea that this is some torture fest because uh, it makes me more badass than, uh, than the next person down the block. This is a hormonal and an energetic boost that is very much under control. So as soon as I get into the water, I actually submerge and I hold my breath. Don't try this at home, but I'm, everything's under control. And then when I emerge, Emerge from the water, I commence a set of 20 deep diaphragmatic breaths where I'm taking as deep a breath as possible, holding it for just a beat, letting it out smoothly. And all I'm thinking about, it's like a meditative experience where all I'm thinking about is the sequence of my breaths and counting my breaths. And I'm feeling fine inside. If I were to get a sensation of cold or to get a little chill, that's when you're uh, indicated it's time to get out because you don't want to overstress the system and have it be a, a net negative experience. Uh, so the hormonal benefits are great. Uh, but what I've really found after doing this now for about three years straight, which is not a long time, but I hope to do it for the rest of my life. Uh, what I found is there's these intangible benefits, which are super awesome. And I feel like my ability to get into that tub every day makes me more focused and disciplined and resilient against all other forms of stress in daily life. And if you listen to some of the commentators on this subject of cold exposure, they talk about how it uh, you know, accesses a, uh, an ancient pathway uh, of renewal and energy and uh, improved cellular function and also that resilience that humans had throughout human human evolution, and we've now gone totally soft and luxurious and decadent where we don't put ourselves under thermal stress anymore. Even uh, year round, we're able to, you know, uh, turn on the heaters and, and get the proper clothing on to where, you know, a freezing cold day is just the walk from your car to your air conditioned, uh, you know, office or home. And so by putting back these hormetic stressors into daily life, and that term hormetic means a brief natural stressor that has a net positive effect on the body. So a sprint workout is a hormetic stressor. Uh, fasting is a hormetic stressor. Uh, a, a weight workout in the gym is a hormetic stressor. And there's a, there's a balance point where too much is too stressful. And just right is what makes you a stronger, more disciplined, focused, resilient person. So the cold exposure is very targeted, very strategic, and then you're you're getting all the benefits without the <laughs> suffering, like it's you know the worst part of your day rather than the best. Do you um, do you do the cold exposure every day? 
Yeah, every day that I'm in town and then when I'm traveling or I'm away from my chest freezer, it feels like there's a void in my day rather than this is some special thing that I'm going to do when I'm on vacation at the health spa. And I love that distinction for anything we're talking about, like the micro workouts or my morning flexibility, mobility routine, which I'm a big fan of. I have that put up on YouTube also. And I've kind of wired this into habit so much so that that's my normal baseline. And if I miss it, I'm kind of bummed. Beautiful. Um, I think that's really cool. I know Tony Robbins is a big guy that is cold plunge. I go down to Bulletproof Labs. I walk down the street and do the cryotherapy. But now that I've got the space in the new bio home that I have here, it's like, okay, we're, we're actually going, we're actually putting in a cold water oh, therapy. Fuck. When you started yeah. out, did you start, how long were you going in when you first started? Oh my gosh, I had the, the rough and tumble uh, journey. So do as I do as I say, not as I did, because what happened was I bought like the farming uh, livestock tank. I'm sure you're familiar with one of those and put it in my backyard uh, and, you know, filled it up with water. Then you had to go get ice bags at the, at the grocery store right. and dump them in there. And then you could only do the cold plunge, you know, right then and there. And then the ice would melt. And in the summer it was too warm. So I finally, you know, after some false starts, I pop for the chest freezer. You can go on Home Depot right now and they'll deliver it free to your door. You plug that thing in. Of course, you need a timer because if you fill it up with water and then turn on a freezer, it's going to freeze into a block of ice. I made that mistake when I uh, went out of town and came back and then had a big fat chunk of ice in there and had to chop through it for, took several days to thaw out. So now by having it temperature controlled, it's a wonderful 24 7. Uh, home therapy experience, which as far as affordability, I mean, I also have a sauna in my backyard from Almost Seven Saunas. Those are great. You got to get one of those too. And so mm -hmm. I can have the, the heat and cold. We got one on shipment right now. So yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right yeah. yeah. I mean, and that, you know, that's a little bit bigger of an investment, but the benefits of sauna are parallel, actually the benefits of cold exposure. I feel like my sauna is more of a relaxation. It's a social experience where people will come over and right. we'll sit in there and talk. For some reason, more people want to go in my sauna than my cold plunge. I don't know why, but mm -hmm. you know, when people come over and do the cold plunge, uh, it's a pretty, you know, everyone gets that uh, sensation of uh, something that's interesting and special and not part of general everyday comfortable life. And I, I just can't go on enough about, you know, the importance of challenging this physical human body to be the best we can be and experiencing some discomfort once in a while. Beautiful. Talk to me. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. You've been very generous. Talk to me about uh, what you're up to right now. I know you've got this mofo uh, product and stuff like that you're doing. You're very uh, big in the kind of the, the keto world and that sort of stuff. So can you talk about what that's all about, what you're, what you're doing with that and where you're going with that and what's the plan? Oh, thanks. Yeah, the MoFo mission, man. I'm on a mission. So uh, my friends at Ancestral Supplements, uh, we created this product and it was uh, designed for uh, male hormone optimization, testosterone optimization, and it's simply an animal organ supplement. So as opposed to the, you know, the great products that you put out and I'm trying a bunch of those, I appreciate that so much. And there's, uh, Vince Gironda was Vince, Vince Gironda, the, the trainer in Hollywood who wrote the wild physique was big into organs and glandulars is what he called from, from organs and it would do all yeah. sorts of interesting stuff with that. So it's kind yeah. of a, talk, talk to me more about it. Yeah, yeah. So this is like a food supplement, right? I'm making mm -hmm. the distinction between a performance or, uh, you know, a vitamin thing where this is just bottled up 100% grass fed animal organs from New Zealand. So a very clean product and it's designed to uh, have the, the, the proteins, peptides, enzymes, cofactors, and molecular biodirectors that uh, correlate to the organ function uh, for, for male optimization. So it has testicles in there, prostate, liver, heart, bone marrow. And so it's kind of fun to uh, put out a product that you you believe in and you're behind just just like your business man you're, you're walking your talk and living the dream but I also realize that um, putting something in a bottle and and having the consumer use it is just really the tip of the iceberg to you know get the maximum benefits out of it so uh, we created this mofo mission behind the product the products called male optimization formula with organs stands for mofo and then 
all these lifestyle elements behind it so that you can sort of you know, get your money's worth when you're investing in a performance supplement, let's say. And so there's these 10 attributes of the MoFo mission. You can see it on my website, bradkearns.com. You click on MoFo, you can download a wonderful ebook, very detailed about how to tackle each of these uh, distinct objectives to be the best you can be, especially to arrest this disgraceful decline that we're seeing today in the average male testosterone levels. Uh, there's research that the levels are declining 1% per year since the 1980s. That was 40 years ago or, or 30 some years ago. So we are not the man that our dad or our grandpa was and it's all kinds of reasons why. Uh, one of them is uh, modern technology, you know, the EMF dangers, the hyperconnectivity, the lack of rest and downtime for the brain, uh, all this other, the environmental estrogenic compounds Estrogens. when we're consuming yeah. food and plastic and drinking the plastic water bottles. I thought I was a healthy guy. I got tested uh, with my Nourish Balance Thrive program and I found toxic plastic residue in my bloodstream. And it was yep. traced back to drinking those disposable plastic water bottles yep. that might have been heated up in my vehicle uh, during the day. And then the next morning, it's nice and cool. And I drink one on the way to the, the gym or whatever. Uh, so we really have to be mindful of getting the pollution out of our environment, the stuff we put on our skin, the stuff we put in our body. So we're talking about diet. We're talking about the exercise patterns. And we've talked so much about exercise, but a quick summary there is like, quit overstressing yourself with too much exercise and poorly formulated workouts and make sure you hit that top end and do some explosive training because that is a huge boost for testosterone, growth hormone, and all those things. But a lot of times we're just numbing that down with doing the crap that I did for so long, which was the extreme endurance training day after day for hours and hours. And that's just a testosterone killer. Uh, when I was in my 20s, in my peak hormonal prime, I would go in and get tested all the time. And uh, my testosterone, serum testosterone was between 200 and 300 usually, which is on the very low end uh, for adult males. And now today in my 50s, uh, I'm routinely 7 50 to 850 863 was my last one and i you wow, know i report this stuff i mean it, it's great and I, as i was patting myself on the back wade to notice that i was in the 95th plus plus percentile for males my age 55 to 59 i sat back and i realized for a second wait a second the 95th percentile, who am I comparing to? But this disgraceful average today mm -hmm. of the fattest and sickest population in the history of humanity. So if there's anything but 95th percentile, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm calling 95th percentile normal. So anyone listening to the show, you want to strive for the very you know, high level of the averages that they use to, to score blood tests and you know, you know, accept nothing less than that. And I'm so inspired by you know, guys in, in my age group or older age groups who are doing these magnificent athletic feats. There's some track stars on the master circuit who are you know, just astonishing what they can do at an advanced age. So you know, the possibilities are there, but we have to hit these objectives one by one and make sure that we're not, you know, uh, depleting our, our natural hormonal essence as males with modern lifestyle practices that are unhealthy. I think the possibilities are, are truly extraordinary. I mean, I just, there was a viral video that just went the other day with Terrell Owens, the former football player at 46 running four forties in a 40 meter with the Tyree kill, one of the fastest guys in the NFL. And they're like, and I'm like, so and he looks like he just stepped off the football field. And I think you bring up a great point, and that is what is normal? And normal isn't anything that you want. If your doctor, if I went to my doctor and he tells me I'm normal, I'm in deep trouble. First off, I don't go to a regular doctor. I go to performance optimization doctors, naturopathic doctors, you know, all these kind of, you know, people who are looking on the optimal side of things because you bring up a good point. Check out the video, listeners, The Disappearing Male on the effects of uh, estrogenization of the society. It's a huge thing. The average 70-year-old uh, in the 70s is where the average 30-year-old is today in regards to testosterone. So that, that gives you an idea of, and, of why that happened. But 
let's uh, we'll wrap this up and, and find out where can people find out more about what you're doing with MoFo, some of your books and follow you on Instagram, Facebook, social media, all these kind of things. Because I think you, you I mean, you look fabulous. You've, you've, you've made the transition from like this super, you know, high intensity endurance guy to these micro workouts, these holistic things, and you're doing things in, in, that are really breaking ground and setting an example for uh, people, what we can really do as we age and we can age, not just gracefully, but optimally. So can we find out where we can reach you? Yeah. Thanks so much, Wade. It's great to connect with your audience. Uh, bradkearns.com. You can find everything, including the, uh, access to the get over yourself podcast. You can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, watch for the, uh, the Wade Lightheart show it was a fabulous recording. You're going to learn all kinds of things about your background and your fun journey. Uh, so yeah, I'm just doing, doing, my thing and then being sure to take that downtime from social media or whatever so if i'm not posting every day my apologies because i'm out there trying to be a mofo myself i love it uh so there you go folks hurt training micro workouts cold plunging you can be a mofo too if you want to be it's the way to live to optimize and of course um, Brad has been so generous with his time. We really appreciate having him. Make sure you check out his Instagram, all the show no links, Facebook media, his website. He's a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information. And more importantly, he's living what he's talking about. And that's a beautiful thing. So for everybody here at Bioptimizers, I want to thank Brad for joining us today and with another episode of the Awesome Health Podcast brought to you by Bioptimizers. And the bottom line is, the thing is, go out and do it today. Just get over yourself. Take care and have a great, great day. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip. Turn cultured foods into superfoods. Raw fermented foods like sauerkraut and low sugar, live yogurt can be good for you, but rarely have enough of the right probiotic strains for therapeutic benefit. So here's a way that you can turn them into superfoods. What I do is I get some raw sauerkraut or a healthy yogurt. Ideally, you know, it's grass-fed or coconut-based. And you can empty three caps of P3OM into a container and mix it up thoroughly. Leave it at room temperature for a couple of hours before putting it back into the fridge. And what's going to happen is these probiotic levels will be multiplied. In fact, it doubles every 20 minutes. And then what you're going to get is you're going to have a food with strong proteolytic activity. To learn more about P3OM and why its patented strains make it the strongest probiotic available, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.